if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder welcome to year 10 that's right. This is the 10th year since 9-11. This is going to be the year where it all turns around. We have them on the run. They're desperately, desperately trying to stifle the 9-11 movement now. We have Cass Sunstein with his cognitive infiltration. We have the uh, Homeland Security putting pressure on uh, Comcast and others to erase uh, Jesse Ventura's uh, FEMA camp episodes. I mean, they're really cracking down. Janet Napolitano on big screens in Walmarts telling you, report your neighbor. Report anybody you see doing something suspicious. Report, report. Well, we just got a new DVD from David Chandler, the one I've been waiting for. I told you about it before the 9-11 anniversary last year. We finally got it in January. The... Uh, the DVD, by the way, look for it right now um, in, in the next coming weeks. The entire DVD is going to be shown on Channel 22 and ch Channel 23. You'll have to check the schedules. Um, it's an hour and 43 minutes. It'll be shown many times, so feel free to check it out. Today we're going to just show you three of those cuts. We're going to start with uh, cut number seven, the, the tower fall rate, the North Tower, uh, David Chandler, the high school physics professor, calculated the fall rate, <clears throat> and we're just about to, uh, we'll bring that up. We're looking for cut seven on the DVD. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We practiced this run. When I first started measuring um, the videos from 9-11, one of the first things I measured were high-speed horizontal ejections from the building. And there are Building 7, as I measured, as we talked about already, it came down at free fall, and I was at the acceleration of gravity. Uh, when I started measuring, the, uh, the North Tower came straight down, uh, or pretty much straight down, and so it's easy to, to measure it as well. When I measured the roof line of the North Tower, it did not come down at free fall. It came down close to two thirds. I think it's 0 0.64, 64% of free fall. But in any case, um, once I did the measurement, my first reaction was, oh well, it's not free fall, and I set it aside. But I came back to it later and I asked myself the question, how, uh, how, much, for how much kind of force is needed to slow it down so that it's accelerating downward but at less than gravity. And so I did the analysis using standard techniques that I do for, you know, when anybody sets up a physics problem. Uh, it's like taking the body that you're looking at and isolating it from its surroundings and apply all the forces to this thing called a free body diagram. And once I did that, I came up with a surprising result. I wasn't anticipating this, but it actually is a very solid uh, proof that the top section of this building was not what was causing the bottom section to collapse. So let's watch the video and I'll have more to say it afterwards. This is the start of the collapse of World Trade Center number one, also known as the North Tower. We are here tracking the motion of the roof line at two tenth second intervals through approximately 32 meters or eight stories. This graph shows the height of the roof line as a function of time. 
The analysis is simpler if we plot velocity as a function of time. On this kind of a graph, a straight line indicates constant acceleration. First note that there is a sudden onset of collapse, as the point we are tracking makes a sudden transition from being at rest to an approximately constant downward acceleration. The slope of the graph indicates that the acceleration is 6.31 meters per second squared downward, which is 64% of freefall. In other words, once it starts falling, the upward resistive force is only 36% of the weight of the falling section of the building. So far, so good. But now turn it around. Newton's third law says interactions between objects work both ways. The forces two objects exert on each other are always equal and opposite. If the upward force acting on the falling block is 36% of the weight of the falling block, the downward force exerted by the falling block must be exactly the same, 36% of the weight of the falling block. In other words, the top section of the building is exerting less force on the lower, stronger, undamaged structure than it would if it were simply sitting motionless. Therefore, as long as the top section of the building is in uniform downward acceleration, it cannot possibly be providing sufficient force to destroy the building. This may seem counterintuitive to you. You might think a falling block coming down on the lower section of the building would exert a greater force than a stationary block. But that is true only if the falling block actually impacts the lower block, which would cause the falling block to decelerate. The only way the falling block can continue to accelerate smoothly, as we see here, is for the lower section of the building to give way without significant resistance. If this rate of acceleration continued all the way to the ground, the building would fall in about 11.5 seconds. This is close to the observed collapse time. So far I've been using the term block loosely. What we actually see here is the falling section of the building turning to dust before our eyes. But what is happening to the upper section of the building behind the dust clouds doesn't really affect this analysis. Given the fact that it is accelerating downward, the top section of the building, whatever its condition, cannot possibly be destroying the lower section of the building. The destruction of the building must be caused by something else. Okay, let's look at this North Tower a little more. Here's the top section that comes crashing down, and according to NIST, this crushes the lower section of the building. This is the North Tower. It has that antenna on top. All right. Now, the key observation that I made was actually measuring the downward acceleration of the roof line. And we found that it came down at about two-thirds of the acceleration of gravity. It's close to that. Okay. Now, the fact that it's accelerating downward is the key observation. And the, question, the, the conclusion we came to is that this top section of the building exerts a force on the lower section of the building that's less than simply the weight of this by itself. In other words, it was giving more force downward if it were just simply sitting there than in, the, in, in motion. And that seems very counterintuitive to people. But let's go through and just clarify how that comes about. Okay? So, we have, we do what's called a free body diagram when we're analyzing things in physics. So this is just the top section of the building. And let's look at the forces at work on the top section. We have gravity downward. All right, this is the, the weight of the building, which is its mass. This has some amount of mass times uh, the acceleration of gravity. There's always also an upward force, which we'll call F. This is the resistive force. All the steel and all on here is pushing upward, preventing it from just uh, free falling. And so if I get what is the net force, it's the downward force minus the upward force. So it's mg here minus the that. Okay, this is the net force, and that's equal, this is Newton's second law says the net force is equal to the mass times its acceleration. But we know what the acceleration is. It's two-thirds the acceleration of gravity. So let's rewrite this, mg minus f is equal to m times two-thirds of g. Now if I do a little fancy algebra, I'm going to move the force over there and this thing over here. I have the force 
this is the resistive force now, is equal to m times, here's the g on this side, and I'm going to subtract this one so it's minus two-thirds of g. So if I have something minus two-thirds of it, I have one-third of it left. So I have one-third of mg. So the resistive force is roughly one-third, and this, as you recall, is the weight of this top section. So the net force of upward force pushing on this block is one-third of its weight. And that turns around because of Newton's third law. If the upward force is a third of this thing's weight, the downward force is a third of this thing's weight. So this is pushing down less than if it were simply sitting there. Now, how can that be? In normal experience, if you have something uh, moving, you would think you would hit something harder than if it were simply sitting there. The problem is, as it hits, it would normally decelerate. So if you hit your fist on the table, the table's going to slow your fist down. Okay, but here we have this thing is coming down and it doesn't slow down. It accelerates right through the interaction. It keeps picking up speed as though there's nothing there. And that's the key idea. There's nothing here because this has already been blown out of the way by something else. So this observation, the fact that this can continue to accelerate through the interaction tells us that the uh, tower down here, the lower section of the building, has been pre-pulverized to allow this to simply fall through it, accelerating the whole way. And that's the key. So, no, this can't crush the bottom section of the building with less force than its own weight. It's, it's falling through a pulverized mass of material. Okay, there's one other comment I'd like to make about this uh, North Tower is, here, there's the North Tower. And I want to credit Tony Zambodi, he's a um, mechanical engineer uh, from back east. And it was a conversation with him that helped me clarify my own thinking about this. The, one of the problems with thinking of this as a block, crushing this other block, is you think of two solid objects hitting each other and somehow demolishing each other in the middle. In fact, it's a lot of hollow space, and what we have are these columns that run the full length of the building. There's about 40, there's about, there are 47 of these interior columns, very heavily cross-braced. Okay, and then we have all these perimeter columns, which are not just for show. Those are very solid um, uh, supporting members as well. But according to the NIST theory, this uh, broke somehow here. And then as they, as they uh, come together, this somehow crushed down the lower section of the building. In order to, for it to crush, these columns would have to hit head-on with these columns. It's sort of like hitting uh, directly in line. But in fact, there's more of a tendency for them to sort of spear past each other like this. And so how would this actually crush this part of the building? Um, this has been used to argue on both sides of this. But what if they missed? How would, uh, I mean, could this top section of the building then just plow through and uh, tear apart the core structure, for instance, of the bottom section? And what Tony pointed out, which is sort of obvious once he mentioned it, is that as these things um, co come together, it's going to tear up the cross bracing of both the top section and the bottom section of the building equally. And so by the time this top section has come down its own distance into the lower section of the building, if this is what's happening, then um, it's going to have basically shredded this whole interior structure.